So in the spirit of intellectual humility, all the bios will be very short. I myself am Nobubele Puza. I'm going to be the moderator um, of this particular session on Mandela and the must fall. Mandela at must fall, beg your pardon. Joining us in the conversation, um, we have um, Sumaya Hendricks, who is um, an analyst on the dialogue and advocacy program at the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Um, she is completing her Doctor of Philosophy in Education at the University of Witzwatersrand, and she was the SRC president in 2009, 2010 at the university. Chair, sorry, <laughs> she was the academic chair. I beg your pardon. Um, we also have we also have Mr. Pedro Mzeleni. Pedro Mzeleni is a PhD sociology candidate at Nelson Mandela University. Um, he's a colleague at the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation, and his research interests are on urban land, spatial planning, student welfare, higher education transformation, and social movements. And then we also have joining us in the conversation, this is Patronella Ngaba. Um, and she is a master's, um, she has a master's degree in politics and international studies from Rhodes University. And she's a researcher for the Atlantic Fellows um, for Racial Equity. And she is passionate about the issues of social justice and helping to address the racial inequality um, left behind, um, left by us, sorry. I beg your pardon, she is passionate about um, she is passionate about issues of social justice and helping to address the racial inequalities left um, by the past. All right. And then we've got all advocate, Utembe Gungai Tobi. Um, he's an author, and most of us will know him for his um, book, The Land is Ours, which was um, South Africa's first black lawyers and, sorry, the title is The Land is Ours, South Africa's first black lawyers and the birth of constitutionalism. So they will be our... Uh, discuss our conversation starters. I beg your pardon. They'll be our conversation starters. And how we're going to run the session today is that we're going to start by having a conversation where each of them are going to make inputs on the title, Mandela at Must Fall. And we don't want to direct the conversation um, much in that, in that input. It's more conversational. We're opening it up for us to have a, a very um, a vibrant discussion on Mandela at Must Fall. And we're going to leave it up to the conversation starters to frame then the discussion and to almost give us a direction as to where we need to go. So I'm going to hand over to our first um, speaker. This is Patronella Ngavana. Good morning, everybody. So, Must Fall. Um, just a few reflections that I would like to share with you today. So Vern came to me last year, we were having lunch, and he was asking me around, what was my perception, my opinion, around how far the student protests have gone, and what do I think about um, the mass form movements? Which was interesting because, you know, when you're a researcher and an analyst and all of that, you think of all the smart things to say. You throw in some big words, some, you know, industry-relevant ones, like Crane was referring to this um, morning around the usefulness or rather the deficiency of language in our disciplines. Um, I had all these things to say and an opinion around what should have happened, what could have changed, where I think the movement should go forward. So Vern was like, oh, cool. Brilliant. Um, there's a colloquium happening next year. I want you on it. And I sat there and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And then yesterday happened. Um, we came on campus and the first thing we noticed was that the protests were on. Now these protests have been happening in other campuses for a while now. But it brought me to a stage where I remembered the first time, the first time I was out of varsity in jo Joburg, you know, trying to make sense of life, and the first protest broke out, and I remember my, my initial thought, thinking to myself, oh no, but we don't do that. Because you see, I'd, I'd come the generation just before the protest, where, so I was down the road um, at Rhodes, and this one time we were protesting around dining hall food. But the rules around protesting were that you protest during lunchtime, so it doesn't interrupt your, your classes, and then after you're done, you know, we pack up, we go back to class and, and pretend nothing has happened. Um, at that stage, our SRC was, um, 
rather quite apolitical, if I can use that term, because there were rules. There were rules as to what the space allowed. There were rules as to how you conduct yourself. There were rules to protest. There were rules as to how you negotiate, how you change the space. Now, why this becomes important, and you know, tying it back to the conversation today around Mandela as a figure of social justice, is his legacy has come under a whole lot of interrogation over the years um, around what he stood for, the choices he made when he was in power, um, people have picked periods of his life. We have Mandela the lawyer, Mandela the radical. Um, and in each instance, people analyze what he stood for, the tactics he used, and how we begin to make sense of this figure that is now celebrated across the world. And how this is relevant to the moment I first heard around the Fees Must Fall movement and trying to to make sense of whether or not is this allowed, is this legitimate protest, what are the rules, how do we even reimagine, was that at the same time, as much as I was like, I can't believe they're doing this, I was also just like, I was in awe of these students who were pushing the boundaries. I was in awe of the imagination, the fact that a group of students were like, we are going to take the system on. We are no longer going to stay silent. We are going to be heard. We no longer will be ignored. And it brings me to the work that we are doing right now. So I work for the Atlantic Fellows for Racial Equity, which is based both at the Nelson Mandela Foundation and at Columbia University. What this program attempts to do is um, convene you know, leaders across the world who are part of movements, change makers, who work in racial equity. And one of the things that we've been thinking through is how do we reimagine the world? How do we repurpose pain? How do we understand this moment? How do we move forward? How do we experiment forward? And also, how do we learn to stand on the shoulders, soldiers of, um, shoulders of giants by looking to the past in order to chart a way forward? Now, all the things I've mentioned are quite difficult. They sound, they sound simple enough. They're all topics that... Um, people have written about, but the main one being also how do we engage with what leadership looks like? How do we engage with changing and shifting institutions that were designed to, to create a world that is mirrored with inequality and injustice? How do we even begin to deal with systems that are also designed to ensure that only a small percentage make it, but that percentage stands as an example of how you can do it if you work hard enough, forgetting the fact that the conditions of the possibilities of self-determination are already taken away based on where you are born, based on the tools that you are given. Um, even the institutions that are meant to correct, and I'm talking about the university campus in itself, tends to be insufficient in, in preparing in preparing me to become a person, a leader in the world. Zillow last night in his speech spoke about, is the university campus ready for the student, um, the pupil now, who will become the student tomorrow? Have we, prepared, have we prepared? We talked about, have we done enough to develop the education that is needed, an education that speaks to the realities of the students on our campuses? So when I think of Madiba, and I think of his legacy, and I think around leadership, and I think about this moment, and I think about the courage, the courage that it took for students to face power, face power down, but also be willing to negotiate, because at the end of the day, we need to build, we need to build a different future, right? I think of one thing. I think of an imagination, and I think of the courage to leave a legacy. I think of a courage to leave a legacy because in every action and how the world interprets it, at some point you have no control of how people perceive it. But the best you can do is chart a way forward to be considerate, to be meta-reflective meta around how you best purposed your life. And I want to charge this room as we have this conversation around Madiba and we have this colloquium around what this institute is trying to 
establish is moving beyond just the technical aspect of imparting skills and knowledge, but to try and have a values-based education system that returns to a place where it, 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 it charges us to become better leaders, better human beings. I think somewhere along the line, we've reached too far and we've left that. I come into the space not as Petronella, who, who, who gets into the system, who've been afforded opportunities, who is molded, but I come into the space and I bring all of me. I come into the space and I carry with me the past of every teacher who has shaped me. I come into the space and I carry a legacy of my family, the stories that I've heard. I come into the space with an understanding of who I am based on, on my skin color, my understanding of culture, my understanding of what I think should happen. And I come into the space in search for an openness. An openness that asks us as people who shape the future to dig deep and truly have an engagement around what, it, what does it mean and, um, to have had to survive in a South Africa that was based on the choices that were made before us. And I think I'll leave it there for now. So we're just going to have the inputs um, flowing after Petronella, we're going to have Pedro, and then Sumaya will then um, close off the session. The role of the sense maker, colleagues, if I can just take you um, through the procession then, um, the role of the sense maker will be, in essence, to tie together the conversation that we're having. Um, every now and again, I will bring the sense maker in, um, perhaps questions that um, he might be better positioned to answer, or questions that you might want to direct to him. Um, but to advocate, in essence, is not going to give an input now, but in essence, going to try then to tie together the conversation. So, Pedro, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, and thank you for the, for the input. It's always a pleasure to sit next to a former SRC president. Uh, I appreciate that a lot. Uh, with me, however, it's a different case. I was uh, the president during the Fismas Hall uh, protests. Um, the, the first point I want to make about the, the legacy question of Matiba is that uh, Comrade Matiba uh, is a leader in recent history, right? And uh, the interrogation about his legacy it is something that I think is at its beginning as far as critical studies about uh, his leadership is concerned. And uh, that work is going to continue for many decades to come. Uh, and what is still going to happen, there's still going to be contestations around uh, who uh, he was and what he stood for and his leadership and his limitations and so on. But however, what we could do as a university is that it's good that the, name is, is na is the university is named after him and the commitment, the intellectual commitment that we could make is to make sure that whatever we do around interrogating his legacy, it takes us towards decolonial and progressive possibilities. Uh, that's what I, would, I can say about the legacy of uh, Madiba. Now, with that said, I want to come now to the question of uh, must fall uh, very quickly. First, number one, I think the universities in the South African context are still going to take some time if not forever, for them to get out of the capitalist outlook or the capitalist fundamentalism that has trapped them in the neoliberal uh, democracy that we have uh, in, this, in, the, in, the, in this particular republic. Um, you still have our universities, in, in terms of their financial structure, being turned around and making students' fees become the main uh, reservoir of financial revenue for the universities to sustain themselves. So the end user, which is the student, the fees are where the, the, the universities extract fees uh, and revenue for them to, 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 to run. And hence, they, they, they run at an inflation-targeting fashion 
uh, more like any other product that you'll find uh, in, the, in the economy. And that's where the debates about education being a, a public good or a private good sort of tend to uh, stem from uh, as far as that um, issue is, uh, is concerned. So, which now, which is at the center of the protest that is taking place even today at the, at, at the university. Uh, the, the, the problem is registration, right? Why students can't register is because of the financial model that the, our universities in South Africa have been shaped upon. Fees are at the center of their financial uh, survival instead of other sources that could be used from the state in other universities that you see normally in Latin America. The third point I want to make is that um, with that issue uh, said, it takes me now to my, to, my, to, my, to my next point is that you still have universities that uh, socialize students into whiteness. Uh, the curriculum is still the same. Uh, and uh, the HODs and the deans are not hold, held accountable whatsoever uh, when there is no decolonial rhythm towards transforming those, uh, those particular curriculums. And what we have now is that, um, which is now the, my, my next critique to student leaders themselves, is that what we tend to do because we waged that, that protest, we think now by stepping back, things are going to fall into place. As if these universities are not always conservative institutions. Universities are conservative institutions, they will always shift to the right, right? So at the time of contestation, that rhythm must be maintained to always pull universities back towards uh, progressive possibilities. So the, the, the decolonial rhythm must not be lowered at all, it must be maintained uh, in the mainstream games that the university likes to play and also in the outskirts uh, camps where our decolonial rhythm came from. So otherwise, if we don't do that, we are going to run at a risk where decolonization gets hijacked by university managers and also gets commodified by the market. Because university managers, they, 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 they like to play games whenever questions of progressiveness are being raised with the institution. You, you see what they did with that crap called the diversity month in this university. It's, it, it's a month that does not have a meaning. Everyone just comes in with, a, with, 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 with any program that they want to do and it's all tagged as a diversity month. But it, even the word diversity is such a liberal word that does not have anything that will shake the status quo whatsoever. It's just a way of being nice to each other, you know, and pretending as if you are talking about transforming the university, whereas in real terms we are not. So decolonization has the same risk, whereby it is now being used and being commodified as a mechanism now for professors to get promotions, for new offices to be created, and all those things that don't address fundamentally the black life that we are struggling for. Right? Now, the last two points that uh, I want to make, in fact, it, in some, in some interviews that I set in, it's even a good thing if in an interview you can prove as a university manager that you have a track record of stopping protests. It's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a positive point. It gets you points <laughs> when you are able to prove that you can stop a protest of students. So these games <laughs> that I am talking to you about, they are real, right? So, that's what I mean by, 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 by the commodification of our struggles by the market. You can see what they did to reconciliation and racialism. They've also become taglines of the market now. I, uh, such that we even went to a stage of hating reconciliation and racialism, yet they were fundamental programs of our struggle. They had actually decolonial objectives those two programs. But the way they have been hijacked, they've been made into things that are meaningless uh, in, 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 in today's life. Right. You also see this with the new tagline now that university managers like to talk about is this thing of mental health of, uh, of students. And their solution is that no, the counseling department will sort this out. But <laughs> What is making mental health problems amongst students of the working class in the university? 
if, you, if, 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 if it's a colonial architecture of these universities that is making us have mental health issues, then how on earth is the counseling going to solve those, that issue instead of tempering with the relations, the property relations that hold the university to, into having its established forms of socializing students to whiteness that brings trauma to working class students? Why are those issues not the core program of the university instead of these games that are being shifted around? My last point. It's also as if now the point of universities is just for academics to debate with each other. That no, I, I read your work, I criticized your work. Actually, you and I, we disagree. We will collaborate and publish. And it ends, it's as if that's the purpose of universities, right? It's for academics to sit, have conferences, listen to each other, critique each other. But what about the, the life of, the, I'm talking about, the question I'm trying to ask is, what, what is the core program as far as the progressive possibilities of black life, right? What is the purpose of these universities, apart from what I just said, of these uh, critique and what what of writings? Then my last point, for real now. <laughs> for real. What I want to ask is, um, coming out now looking from outside, you know, what I want to ask is, uh, how do we begin to have a critical look in the Olympics of the legacies of vice chancellors? By Olympics, I mean, it seems as if there's a competition there as to what happens post-office, right, after the office. For instance, we all know that, I'm trying to make an example about someone who's not in the room. Um, <laughs> Prof. Patat, right, who was the VC of Rhodes, we know that during his term, he was never going to touch the issue of the name change, changing the name of Rhodes University, right? He'd rather focus on other matters, but the core program that of the decolonial project of changing the name Rhodes into something else, it's something that he didn't want to touch on, right? And he left the office with his legacy intact. Others even tag infrastructure projects as legacies, right? Not the insourcing of workers or free education, uh uh. It's infrastructure, changing the name, those are the legacies that are touched on. Now, how do we get to a stage whereby there's accountability when the demands of the working class are being called upon in the university and what are the consequences when those things are not being realized. And the second question, how do we move to a position whereby a university is able to have a critique rhythm that is outside what the VC wants, and if you are at the center of that critique, you are still able to survive as a scholar. Right? There are things that I can't say because I'm not a full professor yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, how do you look at the direction that the top officials want to take the university, and how do you critique that direction and still survive as a scholar in the university? So, how do we have a critique rhythm in the university, a contestation around the Olympics of the legacies of vice chancellors, uh, and still survive as a, as a scholar? So, that's what I, I, those are the issues that I am, I am grappling with uh, around Mandela at, at Massfall. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to start off with two disclaimers. Um, my first disclaimer is that if my contributions are very short, it's only because I want to hear more of Tim Becker. <laughs> and um, my uh, second disclaimer is that... Um, I uh, decided to wear this T-shirt today because I uh, discovered yesterday that um, I, this institution has a chairperson of the council that is a female, vice chancellor that is a woman as well 
as well as, uh, so a chancellor, vice chancellor, and chair of council. And I think that's a, an incredible achievement, and I really just wanted to, to celebrate that. So I really want to, from the outset, state my positionality in regards to this debate, which, uh, to the discussion, which is really that I'm someone who lives in awe um, of the Fees Must Fall movement. And I understand that, you know, when we speak about the movement, each university has different flavors of what that movement is and contours. And so when I speak about um, Fallers, I'm really speaking about them in, in its entirety. And the reason why I say that is because, um, so I served on the 2010 SRC at the University of Cape Town. And um, at the time, I mean, ANC Youth League and SASCO, they were speaking about free education, and it was very much see, uh, seemed like a pipe dream. And I myself also um, saw it as a pipe dream. And so what our SRC did to really um, tackle fees, we got, um, we hired these students, um, these master students who formed some sort of like company, and we got them to really um, study the university fee structure, and it got to a point where we managed to negotiate, get counsel um, to um, side with the SRC, and we got it reduced from around 12% to 8%. So it was the first time, at least in, from what we knew, where the SRC was able to negotiate down fees. And I mean, we were pretty chuffed with ourselves um, for that. Um, Professor Crane was on that council. Uh, I won't reveal which way his vote went. Uh, he, he, can, he can expose that for himself. But... Um, I mean, we were really, and the really, really, we were chuffed because, it, I mean, the climate at the time was that, I mean, what UCT students protesting, it was so foreign to the culture. And so that was, I mean, obviously we told management that we could unleash the students to them, but they didn't know that we ourselves didn't think that not to be true. Um, but, um, but I mean, we knew we had to go another route because mass mobilization simply wasn't, at least in that context, um, something that we were able to do. Um, and so the, the turnaround in student agency and activism in such a short period of time is something that um, I, I know that I wouldn't be capable of and something that I, really, um, that I think is really incredible. So there's really three points that I want to make. Um, the first one is around... Um, you know, Madiba's assumptions that he made about himself and his role and the assumption that he made to other people. So in a speech, you know, he, gives, he gave in 97 where he's really much, really handing over the leadership to Tao Mbeki, you know, what resonates throughout that whole speech is he's saying, I'm handing over the baton. I'm handing over this baton in a relay and I'm really, essentially, he's saying, you know, he's a runner in this relay and he's gotten the baton from you know, generations before him. He's gotten this um, um, relay not only from previous um, ANC leadership, but far, you know, he's talking, and then he mentions um, other people within um, 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 his particular uh, lineage, that he really got this baton. And he said, now it's time for the next generation to continue with this and to play their role in carrying on with, um, with, the, uh, with the role that needs to be played. And he said that his hope is that you know, these, um, these leaders that come, uh, that they, um, you know, are true revolutionaries that only serve the people and serve the interests of people. And so, you know, he didn't see himself as someone that ran the whole race. He merely saw himself, um, you know, in the context of um, one, hum what he says, you know, he making a humble contribution and running merely a small part of the race. And it's my contention that it's students who weren't given the baton, but they really, they found the baton lying on the floor because at the time it was really discarded and they picked it up and they are the ones that have really, you know, t taken forward this race and it's something I think that should be, um, that we should all be very proud of. The second point I want to make is that um, there is a tendency um, to dislodge Madiba from, the his from being part of the tradition of radical activists. Um, even though the, one can't discredit his re uh, revolutionary credentials. And you see it, whether it's, you know, the iconic and Ravonia trial that he's prepared to, to give his life or, you know, he, he joins the ANC, he doesn't join the ANC, he joins the ANC Youth League first in 44. Um, and the Youth League is very much, you know, critical of the ANC. It's saying that 
Um, you know, this organization has been characterized by comprising of professionals and elites, and there's a conservatism in this in the ANC, and so you know the ANC Youth League is formed, and I think that's very significant. And so all of these things, and you know, let alone MK, so all these things point to his revolutionary credentials. So why is it that we, we underestimate and undervalue his um, forming part of this um, radical tradition? And it's really because. You know, what, what people, and I suppose maybe it's, um, you know, just some introspection here that, you know, maybe it's um, symptomatic of the human condition where we are very forgetful. And, uh, you know, so what we saw before us was, you know, a cuddly old man that dances at concerts, you know, to be honest. And, um, and, and, and so, and, and it hasn't helped that people have reinforced this time and time again. So what people in society praise is this cuddly old man, this 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 presidential and post-presidential. So it's not surprising that students reject Madiba because that has come to, uh, to embody and characterize who Madiba is. Um, and so we really need to think about, um, you know, how, how do people talk about Madiba? Who are they talking about? What aspects do they praise? I mean, I also grew up in a household where my first, I mean, Madiba really entered my consciousness in the Rugby World Cup. I have this clear image of, I remember sitting on the table and seeing Madiba and my, um, you know, at the, at the World Cup and, 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 and very much someone that was lavish, my parents like lavished praise on him. So, you know, in, the, in, the, in a time where young people are, you know, questioning the old order, which is also part of the DNA of what young people do. Everyone at some point, you know, in this room did that. Um, you know, so of course, in that, in that questioning um, of the older generation, not only do you question the, the credentials of that, the, um, that generation, but you, you question who those people hold up to be role models. Um, because this, this, this cuddly old Madiba is being held up as, as the, um, uh, what people should aspire to. And, and then just the last point, I do have some recommendations around how the program should be structured but we can talk about that in the discussion section. But the last point I want to make here is that I think there's been, um, you know, we aren't really self, we, we, we overcritical of Madiba. Um, and I think it speaks to the, the lack of self-reflexivity that's embedded into our education system. That we're really not, you know, teaching people to be self-reflexive about themselves. And I think it, it's demonstrated the fact that we can so easily, you know, slip off criticisms about criticism to other people and Madiba, I think it speaks to something there. And so it's not surprising that, you know, it's easier maybe for young people and people to, to more easily criticize um, them because, you know, if Madiba had to pass away in prison, I mean, quite honestly, I think that would have been enough. Like, I mean, his life would have been well served, but he still came out, presidency, post-presidency, the foundations he set up, the work that he did, 4664. And, and, and I think that failure to see that really speaks, to, it's some sort of projection that we really, you know, we're we saying something about, about ourselves in, in, in that kind of harsh criticism. So, thank you. I, I believe it's Kali Lekenwuk. The conversation is now on the table. Um, I think, thank you so much to um, our inputs that came from our speakers. Um, I want us to start the conversation then, or maybe just continue it from this question. How do we, um, how do we or should we engage with Mandela at Must Fall? Sumaya, you've spoken quite a lot about Mandela the man. We've spoken about um, his political credentials or his struggle credentials. Um, while you're also alluding to the social figure and then also then indicating that there is some kind of disjuncture between who he is and who our students drawing from. And I want us to then um, interrogate that a little bit and I'm going to ask Pedro to also weigh in here. That how do we then engage with Mandela at Must Fall? Who are we discussing there? Are we discussing the social figure or have students been using then or drawing on the man and his struggle credentials to lead them forward in the struggle? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think last night we spoke about, you know, Madiba in italics and, you know, Madiba is the person. Um, but I think it's really interesting because I think it needs to be said, you know, you know each generation has like a, a grouping of people that they take as role models. And we just happen to live in a time where unfortunately, to be honest and in plain simple language, Madiba isn't cool. Like, you know, you want to draw on a Fanon or, you know, maybe a Malcolm X. 
And, um, and so I think sometimes I, I almost, you know, like all the people that uh, become concerned and um, dismayed about the questioning of Madiba's legacy, you almost want to give them a hug and say, it's okay, like, you know, this is just like a kind of the climate that we live in. Um, so that's just on the one hand, you know, each generation has their different role models that they take on. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it hasn't, I think um, the engagement with Madiba, just a, a direct answer to you, um, I think it has been a very limited, and, it's, and I think in the same way that Rhodes was a symbol of the decolonization movement, I think Mande Mandela has unfortunately become this, uh, also a symbol of the things that we need to reject around our, tradi uh, our tradition. And so because there's this particular narrative about Madiba, and that people don't see him as part of this black radical tradition, they do necessarily, um, born out of that, they, they, there's this rejection. Mm -hmm. um, and then... And, and then I mean, within that, and it's also our responsibility because we've really like pitched legacies. You know, you need to be a, in our context, you know, a Winnie Mandela or a Madiba fan, or you need to be a, in another context, a Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X fan. And, you know, how do we, instead of teaching the principle of service, we teach, you know, we teach that you have to model a particular type of service, that everyone's service is not valid. You have to serve in this particular way that's popular and, you know, well coordinated and so forth, mm. um, in order to be acceptable. Mm. So, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, for me, Mandela was a black leader who was arrested by the apartheid machinery. And his history is out there to trace as to what they did to him and why he was arrested. Mm. So I don't have time to entertain nonsense that Mandela was a sellout or we don't like him or mm. whatever. That is not what I'm going to do. He's my leader, and I have a good track record of what he did for me to be here today. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there are people that we cannot even trace in the struggle, right? And, they are, and, they are, and we don't hold them accountable or ask them that nonsense. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones who are at the center of holding us into ransom in these institutions. We can't trace their, credential, their struggle credentials. We don't interrogate them. But a, a, a black leader of our people, uh, we, we, have, we have time to raise such, a, such, such issues. So for me, um, the market has commodified Mandela and created its own Mandela. Our duty is to pull him back all the time by being critical of that commodification of Mandela and pull him back to the comrade that we know who he is. He led at a time, at a context uh, that was not his own doing. Mark says that quote that leaders don't choose uh, as to how, I, I, it's just that I don't have the, 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 the direct quote with me, but the material conditions dictate uh, the type of time and space that you are in uh, as far as your leadership is concerned. But we cannot dispute his struggle credentials and the track record that he carries uh, as, a, as, a, as a black leader. All that we can do is take the baton and move forward. And that is what we did. Uh, with, that, with, with our struggle, that is what we are still currently doing, right? And obviously, he won't be immune from criticism amongst comrades in the movement because we have to also trace as to leadership, where did you go wrong? You understand, yeah. right? With all the injustices that were done under apartheid, how come white people have not been held accountable post-apartheid? What happened to the land question, right? The, pro the property questions of the day, we are going to ask those questions and we're going to carry that struggle until it's a logical conclusion, right? So for so long as injustice is coming across us, so long as whiteness is, is, is around us, so long as black students must still be killed in DUT to register, the struggle continues. And when we mention those things, we're not repeating ourselves. We must be, not be blackmailed that we are raising old discussions. We are raising discussions that are affecting us today, right? So Madiba is a comrade, a black leader that I am proud of, and I will take the baton from where he left it and continue the struggle towards this logical conclusion. Um, Patronella, if I could then just pose um, a similar question to you then on the idea of leadership and your experience then with the um, Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Fellows, um, that, that particular research, that international appeal of Mandela as a figure and almost trying to link with what is it that people are drawing from him as student leaders as well, to then also continue and mobilize their activism. Yo, you're not holding back, ne? <laughs> um, 
So on the topic of Mandela and leadership, so I spoke earlier on around how he was, he's been designed as a figure around principles mm. that we understand and aspire to infuse in how we understand the type of leader we need today. So working in the fellowship that has dealt with both US and South African leaders on a, on a topic that is, <laughs> I think I underestimated how deeply personal, how deeply heavily weighing it is on a lot of people to deal with the idea of racial equity, to begin to repurpose pain, to begin to reach across the floor, to, to collaborate with the enemy, while also imagining a different future. When we have not yet resolved what reconciliation actually looked like. The international appeal has been one of, you know, a conflicting one because you meet a lot of people who celebrated based on, um, I think a lot of things that have been mentioned here today, the idea, the dream, the promise of Madiba as a leader, the promise of Madiba as a president and what he stood for. And then coming across some of our leaders who are in a lot of ways disenchanted um, the same way that I think the student movements tend to use the, the, the image of Madiba around more of a promise that never came, more than it is just about him as a man. So we've had to, to wrestle with what that means. We've had to wrestle with what does it mean, how do we redefine leadership? What is this moment calling us to do? Um, as Sumei was saying, what do we take with us, what do we leave behind, and also what are the implications of, of, of reconfiguring that not only for leadership in the future, but how we begin to understand ourselves and our purpose. So it's been difficult, it's been a, it's been a journey that's only just started, but I have, I have a lot of faith that it's, going, it, it's a very productive space that's about an imagination that is currently not here. Um, which is why we, we tend to default to being overly critical, I think. Um, colleagues, maybe just to um, change the direction of the conversation as well, but build on these inputs that have been given, is this idea then of reimagining what Mandela really has to mean in society, but also thinking around what you've mentioned already in your input about trying to reimagine as well how to... Um, to reimagine the world itself. But in reimagining the world, we also need to think about how we need to theorize as well the problems that are in the world. And universities usually were the hub for that kind of theory, of that kind of theory or generating that knowledge about the social problems. But we find ourselves in mass fall being told by students that the problems that you're theorizing about are now here. They are living here, inequality is here, poverty is here, sexism is here, rape is here at the university. So the slant then changes from being theoretical and having to reimagine the world to have to reimagine this space as well as the university. And the vice chancellor spoke yesterday to say that Mandela himself also grappled with those problems. So in thinking around that, um, maybe if you have then some, some thoughts around how do we then um, become better people in the space, reimagine the space in the world, while also reimagining the university as well. Um, sorry, and I'll kick things off. Um, I mean, last night the Vice Chancellor spoke about, you know, this university in service into humanity. Um, and now for my sins, I'm currently doing my PhD. And so, you know, having to make my way through the education system, there's very little points at which I felt that the university was being in service to humanity. And that's just really, so I mean, I've been to like three different universities um, now in my career. And um, I, I don't think it's something that, that, um, that is at least felt by the, uh, for, for, at the, on the user's end, being the students. And you see this very easily, like when you engage with academics and you tell them you're wanting to, just say the word meaningful research, that you're wanting to do meaningful research, and this immediate apprehension, no, like the intellectual endeavor and the mind and, you know, the pursuit, da -da -da, whatever, whatever. Um, you, you always see that apprehension where people, I mean, um, and so, you know, I, I don't think that question is being asked or, um, in very practical. We can theorize, but, you know, feeling like you're in a space that's actually pushing you to think about humanity, 
So how can we expect students to think about humanity and go out in the world and do all of these incredible things when their points of contact in the university space aren't asking themselves of the same questions? And you know, in our work, so we, we've adopted a really grassroots approach over the last year in the work that we've been doing in early childhood development and land. And too often the conversation, I mean, ac ac I mean academia has really allowed this relationship between acad academics, private sector, and government um, and they've really been comfortable in these spaces. Uh, I mean, and acad uh, academics sometimes advance themselves as speaking for the people. And I think it's gotten to a place now where they're so comfortable in being in spaces where there's no community or represent uh, representation, where there's no people that's actually experiencing the problem firsthand uh, in that space that they don't even realize who they're speaking for and which voices that they don't represent. And I think they need to increasingly associate themselves and see their constituency as the very people that they're trying to research um, and, and make sure that they incorporate it and incorporate it into their spaces because it really, I mean, you, it really leads to, I mean, if you really, um, you know, invested in this um, academic and intellectual endeavor, um, you will do it in the, you will include those voices for that very end, because it really leads to, I think, a deficiency of understanding and of insight um, into the kind of solutions and people, um, solutions that people, you know, bring to the fore. <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks for the question. Difficult question. Um, my, just three points from me. The, the first one is that um, around the, the future and going ahead with uh, the Mandela's name uh, as, a, as a university, um, I think the, the direction there should be critical studies on, the, on Madiba, of course, must continue. And then as a, as a scholarship project in the university, there must be a commitment towards decolonial and progressive possibilities. That is all I want to say around uh, the institution that carries that, um, that, that, that name. So critique must be the rhythm of the university. Uh, that should be the alpha and omega of our scholarship project. There must be no holy cows. There's no one who's going to come in and table something that won't be critiqued, all right? And we must hit hard against university managers who want to hijack and commodify and play games with decolonization and the transformation project that we carry. And there must be accountable measures when those games are being played by such people because they are delaying um, our, 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 our entire program that we are doing uh, in making sure that we pull these universities towards the service uh, of our people. For instance, now, there's a gender-based violence question being put on the table. And the entire higher education sector is struggling, right, to answer that particular question. It's the usual tactics, the usual answers to a new challenge that has been brought to the table of higher education, and it is unable to respond to that, uh, to that challenge that has been brought uh, into, 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 into what I'm, which, which brings me to, 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 to the conservativeness of these universities and how the student movement must never get tired of pulling this, uh, this, 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 this monster called these institutions back to the left, back to the service of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of our people. And then um, the last point that uh, I would like to make, I have these discussions a lot with my prof, uh, prof Kit. Uh, the, the, the last point I want to make, it's on um, this, 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 this question of, of free education, right? And uh, how we, how we're going to move ahead. I saw the, the, the week report published by the World Bank last month where they say NESFAS will have inequality in 2030 in South Africa. <laughs> Nonsense. So, <laughs> how do you get to have a higher education system, right, whereby the student, right, as man, 
not our daughter, men as a human beings, men, man. How do you get a higher education system that does not target a student and student fees as its main source uh, of generating its operational revenue? How do you achieve that within a capitalist framework? Right? Because I can tell you with that system, you are going to continue recycling inequality. Right? As far as the economic question is concerned. What is another role that a different and a, and a, different, a differently imagined state can play to temper with those property relations as far as the economics of higher education are concerned? And the last point is on the cultural justice question that was being raised by the must fall movements. Right? Because Professor Susan Boysen focuses on the economics of his must fall, forgetting the cultural question that was being raised, right? That these institutions are still socializing us into whiteness, right? How do we dismantle their cultural biases and make them serve and be positioned in the continent that they are located in and carry the culture of the communities of those people who come from. For me, that would be a true education that has a totally different pedagogy to produce this social conscious graduate that we're looking for that will go out and temper with the status quo in society. Thanks, sir. Um, yeah, just so. I, I just want to make a point on the, I mean, on the question of decolonization. I think um, it's really been sad to see that the burden of decolonization has been on students. Um, especially for an institute that claims that it's a research institute. How do you then put the burden um, on students um, to really advance that? So you've seen, I mean, earlier on you used to see these videos circulating where students were asked, student leaders were asked, you know, what do you mean by decolonization? And, you know, it was at times, uh, uh, in a, you know, it wasn't very well articulated because they, they would ask questions about what is decolonization in science and, you know, kind of a waffly answers were given, which is to be expected. I mean, sometimes it's, it's um, I'm really amused that we don't really put the age of these young people in perspective. You know, like 19, 20 year olds, we, we're asking them to conceptualize what our future, you know, what this pursuit of a decolonization should look like what it should encompass, um, when it's really, I think it's, uh, the, the burden needs to be on academics. They need to, students have raised a question, which I think is enough, and then, and I think now it's about the university really seeing it as their project and, and taking it forward. Yeah, I was just gonna actually piggyback on both your points that you guys have made around the space where I think one of the things that the university have not managed to do is truly be a collaborative space. And by that, I don't mean I write a paper um, and you create me into your protege and you slap your name on it so that it can be published and we move on with life and, you know, I'm great. Um, I mean, a space in which you truly allow students to come as themselves in their fullness. Um, you shape them and educate them. And part of my education and who I become in that space is one that can chart a path of self-determination. Um, I think we, we're very shy to try and push the boundaries and reimagine what this thing could do as opposed to always talking about, you know, skills development and how well I can regurgitate everything that you've tried to create me into so that you live your legacy through me. Um, I think we, we, we yeah, and I, and I think back to my days at, as a university student where we had an entire module around understanding domination in a South African university was what interesting. And none of those thinkers were even from this continent. Like you did your classics, which was amazing, but I could not see parts of myself or parts of that education that resonated with what my challenge would be if I attempt to be a leader post that period. So if you're asking about, has the university managed to do that? I, I, we're very far. And the, the responsibility and the burden has been on students mm. to keep pushing and pushing, and in most cases be, be crushed, right? Because mm. that's not how things are done. Mm. I'm going to ask for clarity on that uh, to, from the speakers, um, Sumaya in particular and to Patronela. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of a contradiction between the two, the things that you're saying, that um, you want students to be activators and they are oppressed already, or the victims of some kind of oppression any kind of oppression, but you don't want them to be solution finders, 
Or are you saying that students need to be all three? They need to be solution finders, they need to be activists, they need to, they are also then positioned as the oppressed. Um, and in that, I want to ask then, at where do you see Mandela in that space? Is, was Mandela not all three? Was he not uh, the oppressed as a black man, also a solution finder and an activist, and he was fighting in the struggle? What should students be? Yeah, I mean, the point I was making, I was saying is that, that assuming that they can be all those three at once, um, I think it's an unfair burden of responsibility. That was, sorry, that was the point that I was trying to make. But you know, it's interesting to say, so if you want to really create this generation of Madibas. So Madiba talks a lot about how he got to the place of development um, that he was at. So, and he speaks around, about the people that nurtured him. You know, he says that all these giants, um, they helped to, you know, um, it made him who he was, that they were able to give him tasks that really played to his strengths and that they built his knowledge. He speaks about going to their meetings and, and not having, he wouldn't speak at the initial meetings he would go to because he just lacked confidence. He didn't have enough knowledge. So on the one hand, we need to grow the, the, the knowledge of young people. Um, and Madiba, you know, when he started reading, he, he grew in confidence and that he was able to articulate himself. But the fact that he's also pointing to the fact that there are these people who have helped mentored him through, um, you know, developing his strengths. He speaks about how their weaknesses, um, you know, covered up his, his, sorry, his, their strengths covered up his weaknesses. And so if you want to create that generation, you need to think about Clearly, knowledge is not enough. There's a personal development component. And it doesn't matter. You know, I've, I used to run a graduate pro a development program, and we had four lists. And you know, I had a four list on the program. You know, speaking to, she, she, at any point in time, she could give up and, you know, give a well-articulated speech to thousands of students. And I think you neglect the fact that just because someone is an orator, that they don't have other spheres of development that they need help with. And so we need to form this relationship with students to say, you, you are really good at these things. You know, how can I mentor you through this process? Because I don't think students are claiming that they are finished products in any way. But clearly, there's potential there to be harnessed. So instead of shooting rubber bullets at them, how do we take them in? and mentor them so that they're able to get to a place where they don't become merely mirrors of what we want them to be, but they reach their full potential in however form that looks like. So, yeah, yeah no, I was saying, I, I don't find the things we're saying contradictory because I think with, to clarify, it's not an either I or. I think she was looking for a fight, but. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. It's not an either or. It's a, it's, it has to be a, a, a process, I mean, I think the term is a dialectic, where everybody does their part. I think that that's part of the problem. We've, we haven't quite worked out who does when, what, when, and how. We always, like, it's easier to pass the blame and not take responsibility. Um, you know, the poverty of the leadership that is needed on both sides. And I, and I think we're not at a point where we've actually had that authentic conversation because everybody's trying to be right. It's all about grandstanding. It's all about, you know, winning. But sometimes it's, it's, it's just about a relationship. And like I said, a collaboration. And a true collaboration, not one where you set the perimeters upon which my, 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 my growth and development takes place without you harnessing what it is that I bring to the table in my authentic, genuine self. So, yeah. Thank you so much for answering that. And Maybe I was looking for a fight, Maya. <laughs> All right. Um, Petronella, um, and I'm going to bring in the advocate here. Um, Petronella, in your initial input, you also spoke about um, the idea of protest and the design of protest um, at Rose University and saying, we protest this way at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and so on, and afterwards, you know, uh, go back and pretend as if everything is, nothing has happened, as you said. But now I want us to maybe just interrogate the idea then of protests and uh, the bringing in of the interdict at universities where students who want to protest then need to traverse that space between legal and illegal, trying to then still bring out the point that they do want to make to the university. And those type of manifestations of protest within the idea of having an interdict. And um, yeah, so if you could just speak a little bit on that the idea of students then protesting and how the form of protest should be when they're trying to manage them, the idea of legal versus illegal. Yeah, sorry, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm getting your question, but I mean, just in terms of the form of protest, I mean, students are learning from what society teaches them, you know, that, that report on the smoke that calls, um, you know, the understanding that once you start getting on the streets, um, that that's when your demands start being met. 
And as I said, and I was you, um, it's pointing to the UCT example, you know, uh, calls around free education, you know, um, the insourcing of workers. And shame, I used to see these dedicated young students would always come around during the day and like ask people that I'd sign this petition around insourcing. And I asked them one day, I, I remember I was in first year, and they said, and I asked you everything that this would be something that would materialize. And they said, no, but it's important to like, you know, raise active, um, a consciousness around it. And so there was almost this, also the seriousness. Um, and, and so things really just turned when things, and let's be honest also, not because other um, uh, spirit technicons and other universities um, that were historically black, would always, there was a culture of protesting. But once, the, once it started turning that these historical white universities also um, would adopt protest, um, and physical protest as a form of, um, you know, petitioning their demands, and was it taken seriously? So, I mean, and that's something that they really very much learn from society. So, on the one hand, while the university is claiming to be a place where there's like, you know, this rigorous academic debate, and at the end, the one who has the best argument prevails, um, it's actually the students have learned that's actually not the case. It's the strongest one that would, uh, will... Um, that you know, no, no matter how advanced their discussion and how well they're able to articulate, that at the end of the day is not going to be the be the form of protest mm. um, that really um, wins at the end of the day. So, yeah. mm. uh, should I comment? <laughs> um, look, I mean, so so if we start with uh, you know this conversation, the sort of micro conversation around what's legal and what's not legal, and the role of students in protesting. So we can start with history, and especially because we're talking about Mandela's life, and look at Mandela himself. You know, how, how did Mandela actually confront uh, the dilemmas of legality versus illegality? I mean, it's quite clear that Mandela was an outlaw, true and true. You know? uh, so, but he justified his sort of outlaw uh, outlook to life in 1962 when he gives the not the Rivonia speech, which everybody likes to quote, you know, I'm, if it needs be, I'm prepared to... No. The, the 1962, when he turns the table against the apartheid government, because he's now standing a trial, but he says, I don't recognize you as your, as, as your lordship sitting there, because you are illegitimate. You have no right to try me. I'm a black man in a white man's court, you know. And then the judge says, well, I am the only judge. He says, yes, but you are a representative of the white system, you know. And then we also see Mandela in that period, 56, 57, 58, 59, the PAC is trying to establish itself. He is one of the people organized by Oliver Tam to break up the meeting, right? We also see him much earlier in the meetings organized by the Communist Party, leading the breaking up of those meetings, you know? So Mandela is the original fallist, right? So, so. So, so he did not struggle with making moral distinctions about what was legal and, and, and illegal. He was quite clear in his mind. In fact, one of the greatest attributes of Mandela is his clarity of thought. He didn't equivocate. Unlike many intellectuals of the era, of the era Mandela didn't equivocate on these questions. We may debate now about whether he was right or not, but getting his record straight, I mean, is absolutely vital. So, if Mandela was here, he would not have come to this meeting. I mean, he would have probably been outside organizing and mobilizing. If he had come here, he would have broken the meeting up. So you're wasting time intellectualizing too much because Soweto is burning. You know, I want to go and burn my pass. I mean, you remember him. He was going to be the volunteer in chief. He took his own pass, he burnt it. That was breaking the law. You know, you remember he decided to skip the country. You know, he said, I am going to be the commander, you know, of MK, the very first commander, skip the country, he left. When he came back, he said, I'm not interested in standing trial and getting arrested. And then he disappears, and that's when he becomes a so-called scarlet pimpernel, you know. So, so I think Mandela didn't equivocate on questions of legality and, and illegality. He was quite conscious that his conduct was illegal, but it was calculated and it was right. And so he was interested in what was right and not what the apartheid government considered to be lawful, etc. So if we want to take anything from that part of Mandela's life, it's always to stand on the side of justice. And sometimes there's a clash between justice and law. 
And this issue about protest brings that clash to the fore. The law still requires uh, 15 or more people gathering and whatever. They must obtain permission, etc. You might look at that law and say, well, that's the law and it's a post-apartheid law. But Mandela would have said, but the law is unjust, you see. And he would have taken it upon himself to illustrate not only its injustice, but its absurdity. And the other point about Mandela is that he wanted to put his own life up front. So if he had a cause he believed in, he took his own life to the, uh, to the fore. Unlike me, I'm quite happy to sit with the protection of a courtroom and a gown. And I'm happy to sit in the protection of these hallowed halls. But Mandela went outside the halls, right into the street. So, so not only do we learn about this idea of what's important is what is just rather than what is legal, we also learn that what is important is personal sacrifice rather than hiding behind the mob. Because Mandela actually always distinguished himself from the mob. You know, some sort of psychologists who have written and tried to psychologize Mandela see that in a negative light. But we can also see it in a positive light. You know? So I would say perhaps those would be the two lessons that we might take as follies from Mandela's life. And I, I really think that it's significant, interesting to listen to the three uh, speakers in front of me, uh, uh, Petronella, uh, Pedro, and, and, and Sumaya, trying to situate Mandela in the context of today. So I don't know if this is now the stage when I'm supposed to give what I thought was important about what they said, okay. or I'm still waiting for you to give me the signal. This is, this is the signal. This is the signal. Oh, this is, this is the signal. All right. So, so three points, I mean, that I, chose, I took from what they were saying. Firstly, from Pedro. Pedro emphasizes the extractive structure of the economy and the fact that despite Mandela's magic, that extractive structure of the economy remains intact. Right? So whether it was in the 80s or whether it was in the 90s or whether it is now, that basic structure of an economy that is based on exploitation remains an intact structure. So has Mandela been impactful in transforming the economy? I think Pedro's answer would be no, he has not been. Even if he, has, he is not to blame for the stubborn nature of the extractive structure of the economy. But the fact is that he has not been effective in the transformation of that economic system. In fact, the economic system seems to have adapted rather than changed. It's adapted from a racist political order into an apparently open political order. But nevertheless, it survived. This is, uh, Pedro, not surprising at all, because according to Sam Peter Blanche, in the 1980s, the big debate about the end of apartheid was actually from big business itself. And it was not about ending racism, but it, about, it was about transforming it, moving it from the political space into the economic space. And once they got those concessions, that apartheid actually can continue surviving in a different guise, they were quite happy to start talking. Was Mandela perhaps caught up in that moment of transition from political apartheid to economic apartheid, which is what we are talking about now, is that apartheid is live and well, but it's no longer called political, it is now economic. But you also raise another important point, which is the cultural domination, which we see in universities and outside of universities, right? So despite Mandela's sacrifices and despite Mandela's own personal life, the question of cultural domination, which you call whiteness, right, continues to inform our discourses. So, for instance, the three of us today are speaking in English. Very proud of that fact. But we might as well be speaking in Kosa and proud of that too. But why is it that our instinctive responses to these public spaces must be in a colonial language? We don't even dream in Kosa anymore. So this point about cultural domination is important. And it's important to frame it as cultural domination rather than as cultural alienation. Because we are in the spaces that are enclosed, captured, and dominated. It is not as if we can go outside and still be university professors. So in a sense, we are truly captured. 
And then the point, uh, Petronella, you raise is a crucial one, which is how should we take Mandela out of the big political and economic structural conversations into the personal? What does he actually mean for me, right, as an individual? Is there a lesson I can take from him to protest? Is there a lesson I can take from him to articulate my concerns? How should I express my own insecurities? It's not as if Mandela had no personal insecurities. But how should I deal with those insecurities in the context of the so-called struggle? Because the struggle is not a homogeneous thing. It is not as if everyone who is in the struggle is not a sexist or is not a rapist or is not a racist. So how should I negotiate within those oppressive structures using the lenses of Mandela? Mandela himself could be one of those things, right? But nevertheless, that does not detract from his other positive attributes. He might well be a sexist. He might well have oppressed women himself. But how should we as individuals negotiate ourselves, I mean, our ways within the so-called structures of revolution? And we should not assume, therefore, that the revolutionary movement is always a good thing. It might ultimately uh, turn out to be a bad thing for us as individuals, even if it is a good thing for society as a whole. And so the negotiation of that personal versus political space is a wonderful contribution that I took from uh, your, your input, uh, Petronel. And then, Sumaya, I think your, your point is an absolutely crucial one. In fact, as you were talking, I turned back and I looked at this uh, uh, thing behind you. This is a, supposedly an image of Mandela, but his name is there and there is nothing under his name. And this is probably a perfect illustration of how we understand Mandela. We never see this. What we see is a blank canvas. And because we always see a blank canvas, we can write anything we want, and that becomes Mandela. And this, for me, is probably the greatest challenge in trying to understand Mandela. We don't understand enough of him. There is so much that is still invisible. Despite, I heard uh, Professor Soudin saying here, he has read a lot about Mandela. I think many of us have read a lot about Mandela. But so much still remains hidden and invisible about Mandela. And it is still the responsibility of us to try and make visible that which current scholarship has made invisible about Mandela. Just recently, I went to the archives at the Pretoria uh, archives. I found one of the files where Mandela writes an affidavit admitting to have struck with a, an elbow his first wife, an affidavit that went to court, right? How does one engage with this in the context of the big man, in the context of the hero? How does one actually try to tell that story in a way that's compassionate and in a way that tries to understand the man in the context of his own circumstances? But we must nevertheless make that visible put that up front. How is it that so many people who have written about Mandela have missed this part of the evidence, right? So much. Mandela once represented Robert Sobukwe, right? Sobukwe had been arrested after, shortly after Shabvi. His bail application was run by Mandela. How is it that Mandela has also been divorced completely from the Pan-African traditions, right? As if Mandela was an enemy of the PAC? How is it that we actually do not know about the personal correspondence between Sobukwe and Mandela? Despite everything that has been learned about both men, how is it that Mandela has been taken away from the Pan-African traditions? So what is the way of making visible that, that scholarship has made invisible about um, Mandela? But another problem, of course, is your question. Why is it Mandela, why is Mandela divorced from history, right? Why do we understand, you say, Mandela, the sort of uh, uh, grand grandfather that's dancing and kissing children, etc. And that's not a bad thing, you know, grandparents should dance and kiss children. But why is it that the, the only understanding of Mandela is precisely Mandela, the teddy bear, 
right? And yet Mandela is the ultimate revolutionary, right? The truth about Mandela, he's, he's the ultimate revolutionary. Probably much more than Nehru, much more than Gandhi. But our understandings of Mandela is Mandela the teddy bear. Has he been captured by historians? Has he been hijacked by history? Or as you point, point out, uh, Pedro, has he also been commodified? Right? So these are questions we should be asking about Mandela and our understanding of Mandela. I, I wonder, though, Sumaya, whether talking about history as if we are talking about the same thing, you know, whether we should not probably start by problematizing the question of history. What is history? How do we understand the past? Because we might perhaps, by asking the broader question about understanding the past, then try to reassess our understanding of Mandela, what he stood for, what he meant. So, I go to the archives, looking for the story of conquest. Perhaps that is my point of departure. But I look at the same documents which tell me a story of resistance. Historians write about Mandela as an outlaw, right? as someone who was resisting apartheid, as an accused person. Every book that I have read, including this wonderful one, um, Young Mandela, The Revolutionary Years, always portrays Mandela as a revolutionary, an outlaw, a person that is willing to sacrifice his life and to put the interests of his people first, etc. All of which are supposedly positive attributes. But I am discovering Mandela, the professional, the lawyer, the intellectual, the strategist, somebody who informed the legal thinking in relation to his defense, somebody who assisted the legal team in thinking critically about how to engage with the different interpretations of the statutes, the different interpretations of the regulations, and the different interpretations of the case law. So why are we not told about Mandela the scholar, Mandela the intellectual, Mandela the lawyer? He is not the only one, right? He is not the only one that is portrayed, right, as a client of Bezos and Chaskelson, right? Many of them are consigned into the status of subservience by history and by us. The generation that came before Mandela, the Semes, the Manganas, the Monsiwas, had been completely erased from history as if they never existed. Mandela had been hallowed and made to appear, even actually falsely claimed, that he was the first black lawyer in South Africa. Him and his friend Oliver Tambo ran the first legal practice. Incidentally, that claim also appeared in his own biography. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with that, right? But our function is to also try and find the stories right, of black intellectual traditions that history has pushed further and further away from our imagination. So perhaps, to come back to your important question, Sumaya, we should also be reimagining not only the future, but the past as well. Right? And that means we should take the archives seriously. But it also means when we engage with the archives, we may be reading the same words, but we may be interpreting the different meanings of those same words. So we should not assume, lazily assume, the correctness or the accuracies of the interpretations. So Pedro, what should universities be doing, right? Yes, people should stop being self-obsessed. They should be funding students that are reconstructing the archive, right? The archive is not only at the university library. It is not at the state archive, but it also lives in memory, particularly the black archive. The black archive is there for us 
to reconstruct, but we have failed to do so. The same way as the Mandela archive, there is probably a thousand Mandela stories that are waiting to be told. And there are different ways of understanding Mandela that are still waiting to be told. But we have not done enough to reconstruct the memory, the imagination, and the understanding of what Mandela was, what he stood for, and what were the choices. That takes me to my second last point. Our understandings of history themselves need to be recalibrated. So today, we are critical of Mandela, perhaps rightly so. But when we are critical of Mandela, we are using today's lenses, right? We are not placing ourselves in the moment in time. We are not thinking about what life was in 1947 when Mandela wrote the letter saying, I live in Orlando. I have to use a candle. And that is why I am unable to make the academic standards that this university requires. He is not the only one. Another Indian student is also unable to make the grades that the university requires. But that Indian student is allowed to write a supplementary, and Mandela is not allowed to write a supplementary. In the context where he has been told by the dean of law at Vets University, Khan, that you would rather study to be an attorney, because I cannot see that a black man could ever qualify as an advocate. In the context of that, what were the real choices that were available to Mandela? The period I've been studying about Mandela is 1952 to 1962. Probably the most revealing period of Mandela's life. He gets divorced. Well, at the same time, he also gets married. Some people can do that. <laughs> He qualifies as an attorney. He opens a legal practice. He is swamped by clients. He is arrested in relation to uh, 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 the Freedom Charter. He is arrested in relation to the protest around the passes. He starts MK. At the same time, he is raising young children. And eventually, he makes the ultimate personal sacrifice when he decides that I would rather be the volunteer in chief in relation to the establishment of MK. And the choices that confront him at the time are probably most starkly put in the 1962 speech. And he says, I have no more options left to me. The only option I can take at the moment is the ultimate sacrifice, my own life. So yes, thinking about Mandela, can be a complicated, perhaps a perplexing, and perhaps sometimes, as I have found in thinking about and writing about and then researching, ultimately demoralizing, because the standards are so high that it is almost impossible for us as individuals to even aspire towards them. I cannot think of laying my life for any cause. I personally can't. I know many fears must fall, you know, saying, okay, you shoot me. Or when the bullet is coming, okay, sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. The final point. So, my final point is, rather than thinking about interpretation about Mandela's life, we should probably be trying to understand it. We should probably be trying to reconstruct it, understand it. In doing so, we should probably be doing it with a little bit of compassion and with a little bit of placing ourselves in the scene of the moment as the events were unfolding. One of the best books that does that, which is both critical, reflective, but also very compassionate, is this book by uh, David Smith. I don't know if when my project of rewriting the period of 1952 to 1962 would be successful in trying to be truthful about Mandela's life, at the same time trying to be realistic about the options that 
we're facing him, but also doing it in a way that is compassionate. I don't know if that will be possible at all. The post-constitutional state is a perplexing state. It is a very complicated state. South Africa's economy is a first world economy, but at the same time, it is a third world economy. But I, I think that we do Mandela a disservice by focusing too much on his legacy as president. It is possible that Mandela was just a normal president, an ordinary president, probably a dismal president. But that should never blind us from Mandela, the revolutionary. In my own estimation, I think he's probably the greatest revolutionary of the 21st century, right? Both actually the 20th and the 21st century. It is impossible to think of a revolutionary as strong, as motivated, as courageous as Nelson Mandela was in that period, in the context of the challenges that he faced and in the context of the choices that he personally made. But I think it's true at the same time that you could segment your life into two. Into two. What was Mandela like as a revolutionary? But what was Mandela like as a president? Probably an ordinary man as a president. He tried what he could. Even on the land issue, there was a point when I was critical about Mandela on the land question. But I have gone back to the choices that had to be made during the transition. And I've gone back specifically to the route that Mandela had to follow in relation to the choices on land. And I now think, actually, upon reflection, the choices that they made, which was, let us keep the land issue intact for now, but let us allow the state, the authority, to radically revise, and let us allow the judiciary to supervise that radical revision of the land question by the state. I think that choice was probably the most realistic choice at the time. It is also crucial to see that choice in the context of the larger Southern African region. In 1979, Zimbabwe had just been through a war, and they had a meeting in England at Lancaster. When they negotiated around the property clause, interestingly, they came to the exact same conclusion that South Africa did that you will not be able to disrupt property relations at one go. And the choice was, we will keep the property relations exactly as they were, but we will allow the state, the authority, to disrupt those property relations. Interestingly, 10 years after Lancaster, in 1989, Namibia also had its own constitutional reform negotiations. The conclusion they came to is that all of the property taken under apartheid and colonialism will be allowed to be kept by white people, but the state would have authority to take it afterwards. South Africa came as number three in this family of free countries. They did exactly what Zimbabwe did, and they did exactly what Namibia did. And the other interesting bit about the land issue is that Zimbabwe, after 20 years, completely collapsed on the land question because of bureaucracy, corruption, market fundamentalism, and political expedience. It was the MDC in 2000 that proposed an alternative clause to the property clause in the Zimbabwean constitution. ZANU-PF was still stuck with the Lancaster clause. ZANU-PF subsequently hijacked the property discussion from MDC for political reasons and ran with it. It is so striking to look at South Africa and the similarity with the fact that one political party has hijacked a program of another political party and is running with it, not for constitutional reasons, but for political reasons. So often when we debate, we take ourselves outside of the grander regional dynamics. And so I come back to this point about could we have done the land question differently? For me, it's become impossible to think how it could have been different. It could have been done differently in the light of the military power that the apartheid government still wielded. I gave a speech at an ANC function where I criticized the ANC for having sold out on land. An old comrade who was at Robben Island stood up and asked me 
what would you have done if we had gone and tried to take these farms and these whites stood there with Constant Felyun outside waiting with their guns? And then he said, but I will tell you, because you were not there, you were too young. It is because we did not have the army that we couldn't do anything radical about land. We now do. And we can move a little forward in relation to the question of land. So do not come with your radical theories, which have no basis in practical reality. So I shut up for the first time. <laughs> of course, you know, Pedro, you are right. There is no reason not to transform universities. But, you know, I went to speak at the Tabombeki uh, Foundation. I had a long interview with Mbeki. Asked me one question. You guys are saying we should have taken the mines. Where are the black engineers? Right. We can ask that question now, because it's been 25 years. We should have had black engineers. But we cannot ask that question in 1994. Right? Because we were still grappling with the problem of a product, of a system. So, again, when we assess Mandela, we should try not to be ahistorical and to place him at the time that the choices were made and to look realistically at what options were available. And who else? And that's the point of the comparative analysis I've been trying to make about Zimbabwe and Namibia. And who else made different choices at the time? And hence, I keep coming back to this conundrum, that yes, I start off as a critique of Mandela, but I ultimately end up as a huge fan of Mandela. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, advocate. I think now I just want to test, uh, colleagues, the appetite for engagement, um, just with a show of hands, just to indicate who would then want to give input, questions, comments, um, or pose anything to the panels. Okay, two, all right. So I'm going to open up uh, the first round with just those uh, five hands. I'll start up here and then I'll go this side to the back and then we'll go back on this side. All right, okay. we can get a mic. And colleagues, if you are posing a question to one of the speakers, if you could just um, indicate who it is. Mandibambia Gazanda was me in Petrosin Kobo. My name is Apio Bizan. Uh, my, my question will be directed to all the speakers, uh, including the advocate. The first problem is the problem of South Africa itself. South Africa as a society was born out of the political imagination of white people. And it was a, a white supremacist arrangement that is meant to benefit white people. When it was born, then hasn't changed much now. And so are the universities, because the universities were established to keep the children of the settler colonizers with what is happening at home um, in the metropoles. So my question is to all the speakers, does the legacy of Mandela uh, situated in the Nelson Mandela University, which is currently enacting brute violence on students, possess sufficient theoretical handles with which we can decolonize society. Dabule. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Michael Kosa. I'm from the Human Sciences Research Council. Um, I was interested to hear, Sumaya, in, in your opening remarks uh, quite a lot about the generational differences, young people versus old people. Um, you said things like, every young person questions the old order, 
each generation has their own uh, role models they take on. And I think there is an issue here. You know, we, especially old white uh, males, tend to be very ageist in the way we approach um, uh, conferences like this. So what I want to ask is, you know, clearly there needs to be some rapprochement between old university bureaucrats and students, because I think that is one of the, the underlying tensions. And, and my question is, what could the enablers of that be? And is it perhaps compassion is, is one of the possibilities? Uh, you know, Madiba spent 27 years in prison. You know, <clears throat> this shaped him. Um, arguably as much as his, his life before that. And coming out of prison, he showed compassion and sought to perhaps not reconcile, but concile all South Africans. And my question is, perhaps for young and old, what will our 27-year moment be? What is it that Madiba learned in prison about himself that enabled him to come out and show the kind of compassion that he did. Thanks. I just want to give uh, the speakers uh, just a moment to answer those two questions. I think the questions are going to be quite deep and um, can be answered in, multi in multiple ways. So I'm just going to give you a chance to respond to those two questions and then we'll go back to, to the rest. There's something I want to pick up from the first speaker. You, you know, you were speaking about the education system being designed for, um, for whiteness. And um, the advocate here will remind me about the, the reference point in his book, but you know, he speaks about the, you know, um, this conversation, this early meeting that happened, and, the, and they're talking about the, um, the, the education and the flavor of education that um, young black South Africans should receive. And it was very much for you know, menial labor. It wasn't about developing the mind. Um, and so we see how that manifests in like post South Africa, um, um, like post apartheid South Africa, where on the one hand you have these um, tertiary institutes that's been designed for white people now being occupied by black students, and yet there hasn't been a change in pedagogy. And so you know, there's this what he spoke to about you know the. the struggling to, to operate within that system because, in, I mean, it, it's not even making the assumption. It, it, it's literally, it was not designed for black students. But, but the other interesting thing is that um, because there's been this, this instrumental, this, um, this, the, the, this approach to education and this um, for black students saying we're going to, you know, focus on technical expertise, you know, in post-apartheid South Africa, we see this, like, a rejection of that by, by many young people not wanting to go into those fields because it, it's not seen as, you know, as, um, as, as lucrative as, you know, engaging in um, the, uh, the academic pursuits within a tertiary education. And so we need to think around how we, uh, when, we when we push for um, advocating, and, and it's very easy to say, you know, we need to model ourselves on, like, you know, technical expertise and how um, people educate themselves in a German context. We need to think about um, the, the trauma that black people carry, that when you speak about technical expertise, it is a way of you know, putting people down. And so we need to think about how do we even reimagine, re not only the, the academic space when we're talking about tertiary institutions, but even when we're talking about technical expertise, because it was so geared towards menial labor and not developing of the mind. Um, so, so that is the one, that, that's the one point. That, I mean, just a, an answer to your question about the enablers and kind of this bridging between, you know, this generational gap. I mean, I think on the one hand, I mean, what you're speaking about, compa compassion is obviously key. Um, but I, I think the other thing is that until, um, you know, the, on both sides, there's a reflection of oneself. So if, if your demographics of the students are changing to be increasingly black, if there's, as much as compassion as you may have on the other end, on the side of academics, until that the academics start reflecting the racial composition of students, it's a very hard and almost impossible gap to fully 
um, to fully bridge. And I don't think it's some sort of deliberate agenda where you know, white academics deliberately try to um, mischaracterize students or not understand. I think it's, I mean, the reference points are just so different. And you know, the context in which students operate versus these professors that it's just, it's, it's really a hard bridge to, to gap. So the one question to ask is how do you bridge the gap? But the second question that you ask is how do you actually just change the composition so that instead of thinking around how to bridge the gap, um, you won't have to even bridge a gap in the first place. Um, there was one question that came to me from up here. Um, what, what I can say to you, my leader, is that um, the decolonial rhythm, uh, it's not going to be done for us by uh, the management of the university, right? Um, because that section of uh, the university, after this colloquium, is going to go back to its usual stuff that it does, the, the compliance, the emails, um, making sure that they pass audit. It's going to go back to its crap, right? So what you do in that space to continue the decolonization rhythm is to continue with the, our own spaces that we've created in the system, right? Uh, to, to debate these issues, to ignite each other on what needs to be done uh, for the system to be pulled into the direction that we want it to be pulled on. The nice thing now is that it looks like decolonization is becoming a, a nice thing that the university talks about publicly now. It's in, it's in its official statements and all those things. Even though it might be doing it for compliance issues, we should take advantage of that, right? By holding it accountable with our own uh, radical actions that to us, this project, it's not for statements. These are the programs we're putting on the table that we want to carry forward practically as the, the, the student movement, right? So the, the, the book clubs that we've been running, right? The, the current project we're on now of turning residences into decolonial spaces of shifting the pedagogy of our students there, those platforms must continue from our side, right? Because I'm sure what you've learned outside of the classroom, it's a degree on its own as compared to the tunzu you were learning in the classroom, <laughs> right? Most of the decolonial project that you have in, and, 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 and your outlook in shifting the patterns of society, it's something that you learned outside of the classroom. So the platforms we're creating outside of the classroom must be intensified, right? Because when I left the, because when you're in the SRC, you have the privilege to even sit in these big committees and you're like, oh, okay. When I, when I was living at, uh, at, at, at the level of EXCO, there was, not EXCO, man, what's that committee below council? Senate, yes. At Senate, they're still asking, what is decolonization? No, in my faculty, we're still defining what decolonization means. 2017. In the African continent, we must still explain what decolonization is and why it must happen. Can you see where they, they, are, they, are, they are still are, right? It's still those uh, cosmetic discussions there that do not have a, a practical action towards what we seek to achieve as far as decolonization is concerned, right? So how then do we make it, even this word, man, I don't want it to be a slogan, right? But rather it must be a, a programmatic uh, mission, right? That has its different mechanisms in carrying our program forward. So the platforms that we have created for ourselves uh, to shift our own pedagogy for ourselves, those platforms must continue. Our other spaces of education for ourselves, it's the protests that we run and the interdicts that inspire us to wage more action against the status quo. 
those type of actions must continue. And I say this because the advantage we have now is that across the higher education sector, majority of students enrolled are black students across the sector, right? So you can imagine when those people become graduates, having been socialized in our decolonial spaces that we've created amongst ourselves, you are going to have a new breed of citizens who have a shifted pedagogy, right? You're going to have new, a, a new breed of graduates in society who have a shifted pedagogy. Because one of the things that we must instill amongst ourselves is the obsession of looking at the value of education based on the type of car it can buy you when you graduate. Because it's, it's as if when you do a BA, you are stupid, or these ones who are doing medicine who are, who, who, who are happening, right? Because they go on and their qualification has a certain value in the capitalist market, right? However, in our own cycles, we need to dismiss that type of psychological thinking about education by looking at ourselves as citizens who have value as a collective based on the pedagogy we gave ourselves in alternative spaces that we created in the university. So the university space has many possibilities that we can imagine about what we want to, 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 to achieve. So let them play their games. We create our own platforms. When we meet, we confront the status quo and pull the university to what we want it to be. The fact that it is writing public about decolonization, whether it's playing games or not, it's wonderful for us. We must use that uh, direction and pull it to our own direction. Um, so I don't think there's an easy answer to your question, but I have a different sort of opinion to Pedro. And this is built from the program that I've been working in for some time now. Like I mentioned earlier on, it's a program that convenes a number of leaders from South Africa and the US who all have you know, a commendable track record of coming up against power, doing things in the world. Um, we often dealt with the question around um, blackness, we also dealt with the question around how do we deal with the inherited institutions? How do we begin to even change them or repurpose them? And with that conversation, as much as it's, it's we, we came at a crossroads because as much as you, you're right, we have to create spaces in which um, we reimagine, in which we develop, in which we try to change the course. But I think in that calculation, what we miss is what happens when you start running up against power. Power that has held on, that has generations, that has much more resources to work with than you do. Um, I think in our strategies around how we reimagine the world and change, we don't go as far as um, being future forward uh, in the sense of, of understanding that every action has a reaction and how do we react to that reaction when it happens? How do we stay the course to achieving this goal that you're saying when we've built you know, parallel systems to try and deal with the problem that we need to face at the core? So for me, it's, it's, it's a road of discovery and it's gonna take a long time to even begin to... I, I know the frustrations of being you know, bottled down about the fact that we're still trying to discover and redefine what decolonization is. But I think we need to slow down in order to go faster. We need to do the actual work and accept the muddiness, but also not distract or you know, go into our corners and not face power. Because I think for me, that's where the revolution has always um, you know, collapsed, when it is faced with those, with those um, reactions. And to answer the second question around the generational gap, it's another thing that we've been dealing with. So, there's different styles and understandings of what is needed and what the moment calls us to do in terms of leadership. What even, um, advocate you were talking about, um, the question of justice. What does justice look like? Justice looks very different from generation to generation because of what Sumeya was saying around what formulates and our understanding of the world and what, ha what we're equipped with um, versus different generations. But I think for me, it's about reaching across and what I was talking about earlier on, an openness. I think we lack an openness of, of trying to put ourselves in other, other people's shoes 
authentically and understanding, although there are differences, what's at the core of what they're trying to get at? And where are those meeting points? I think that for us would be a way to, to combine the two and chart a way forward. Right, thank you. I'll take the, the last three hands that we had. Um, oh, sorry, advocate. Can I ask for Kalela now? I really did think the, the responses were, were truly excellent. But, you know, now that I've got the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I, I think there are three points I, I really want to make, and I'll make them shortly. So, I mean, the point about the establishment of South Africa as a colonial construct, it's true as a matter of history. But that's as far as that debate goes. South Africa today exists, and the idea of reimagining it as a political entity, I think seems to me a little bit far-fetched. In 1963, the Organization of African Union met. The big question was, should Africans redesign the borders? What did they decide? Overwhelming majority, no. So Africans have accepted the 1883, now 1884 borders drawn in Berlin. Do whatever you want with that information, but they did. But that obviously does not mean we should be happy with its economic, political, and cultural construct, which is what we are debating in conferences and universities across. And this is what the input is really about. It's not redesigning whether South Africa should or should not exist. It's accepting that it exists, but remodeling it so that South Africa truly belongs to all. So on the point about education, I would make only two points. The one's a point of history. Sumaya is right in my own research about the origins of black education. Black students were kidnapped by whites and sent to school and beaten up and told that if they spoke in their own languages, they would be killed. And that they should now stop praying according to Kamata Katai. They should start praying according to God, to Jesus, etc. They were told they must strengthen up their hair. They, must told, they were told that they must abandon their uh, traditional attire, the, the, the goat skins and the other things, and that they must wear these things, uh, final shirts and whatever. So the process of educating the native, quote-unquote, was a traumatic process, deliberately engineered from Europe and executed here by people that were meant to be men of God, missionaries. And corporal punishment was routine. You were caught speaking in your own language, they would beat you up. We know also this from Mandela's own book. Mandela had no interest in changing from Holy Tata to Nelson. But it was an instruction at the school. The same thing with uh, Oliver Tambo. Oliver Tambo also had no interest in being Kaiser or Oliver. That came as an instruction from school. That was not an accident. It was part and parcel of the cultural reimagination of the native through the eyes of the European. So education, whether we like it or not, has fundamental colonial origins. That is a matter of history. Today, we are grappling with how to use those instruments for liberation. I spoke about language. It's, language is crucial as an instrument of decolonization itself. One of the greatest achievements, if you read the book, uh, D.F. Milan, biography of Milan, or for that matter, the book called H.F. Uh, Fervut, also a biography of uh, Fervut. What preoccupied the Africaners after Africans became an official, Africans only became an official language in 1926. After it became an official language, what preoccupied the Africaners was how to equalize Africans to English. So the first stage of decolonization, where they were decolonizing themselves from the English but at the same time creating the structures of equality between the two, was language. And making sure that Africans was a language of culture, a language of science, and a language of education. Alongside the process that was embarked upon by Fervut was the development of native languages. Not in order to empower native speakers, but in order to perpetuate his system of so-called uh, separate development. But nevertheless, it had positive outcomes in the sense that Kosa, English, etc., they also became languages of research, became languages of instruction, and became languages of culture and the skill to develop and to write them. It is such a pity that 
African languages have died in the age of decolonization. And when we decolonize, we are not thinking about decolonizing. The method of learning, you, you talk about the pedagogy, it's, it's the method of learning that also needs to be decolonized. So we are talking about decolonization, but our methods of learning and acquiring knowledge are still methods of the West. So this idea of dreaming in English is an important idea to think about how do we create new ways of acquiring and dissemination of knowledge in true indigenous fashions. So one of the things we should be doing is thinking seriously about African languages. An important part of education was cultural debasement. It was the idea of always taking you away from your people and telling you that you were better if you were not being uh, kidnapped. You were always told that you were better. So it was the us and them. And the key part about the new form of education is the destruction of that separation and to create that unity between us and them. But finally, one of the things that Mandela rejected, even he would have probably rejected it, even in the age of uh, decolonization, is parochialism. Mandela thought that things were integrated. Although he believed, for instance, in the poetry of Mkai, which was very, he was very proud about, and although he believed in the traditional system, but he looked at the world as an integrated thing. He didn't look at the world as separate items moving in separate directions. He had the conception of the world as a unified uh, entity. So we have to think seriously about our conception of decolonization, which ultimately ends us in a parochial state where we are so coarser that we forget that even that coarser identity is inauthentic in the sense that it's integrated with so much whiteness, with so much Khoi blood, with so much Zulu blood, with so much Mvengu blood, that it is actually impossible to talk of ethnic identity, right? So decolonization sometimes, for me, I get scared of it if it starts acquiring sort of an ethnic and a, a, a form and, and, a, and a parochial form. I try to think of decolonization in the way that is truly, truly uh, integrated. And so to use the, the lens of equality uh, more than anything. But in order to get there, we have to develop. And your point, Petronella, is an excellent point before I, I, I forget to uh, compliment it. In the sense that we have to build the process one brick at a time. There are no easy solutions. Even the decolonial imagination means that we have to spend more hours in the archive and more hours in the universities and more hours in the libraries developing the alternative forms of knowledge. But if we have to develop alternative forms of knowledge, we must master the existing knowledge. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, colleagues, the inputs and the answers were very rich. Do not be afraid if you're to be captured, if your question has already been answered in the discussion and the answers. Um, this is a safe space. You are allowed to be captured. All right, so we'll take the final three. It was one, two, and at the back. Um, gentleman is, is telling me to go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jolene. Don't worry, Pedro. I'm not going to ask you a question. Relax. <laughs> um, I'm a senior research specialist at the Human Sciences Research Council in the Democracy Governance and Service Delivery Program. I'm also an associate professor at the Center for Gender and African Studies uh, at the University of the Free State. And I also lead the South African chapter of the um, Gender and Transformation Academic Group in Gender and Transformation in the Indian Ocean Rim Association. So all of these discussions kind of links into transformation, right? Where we are now, where we want to, where we want to go. Um, and it's also a very political project. Issues of transformation, of decolonization, it's, it, it remains highly political. 
And I've picked up on some themes that I quite enjoyed. Um, for example, the one was a lack of accountability uh, for not having diversified reading, the need for self-reflection, the need for, for creating alternative forms of knowledge. So my question is more a dare we question. Dare we read alternative literature from alternative voices? Um, working in the spaces that I do, Fanon, as you mentioned, is very fashionable right now, right? Uh, Biko is very fashionable right now as well. We should be reading Mandela, but we should also be reading maybe feminist um, literature, thinking Julia Kristeva, for example, and her book on the sense and nonsense of revolution in order to start building those theoretical tools to move towards a decolonized or a transformed way of being. Um, good day, colleagues. Firstly, congratulations to the three parties who've put this together. I'm always, as a non-South African, intrigued as to how we can bring so many disparate parties together. Um, my name is Kojo Paris. I'm a lapsed Marxist and a former investment banker. Um, I'm, I'm particularly, and, and I'm not going to comment directly on the Mandela issue. I spent 10 years, probably until around 2016, 2017, managing the portfolio for part of the Mandela family. But I want to make, to, to, to make a sort of meta observation about what we're doing here today. Firstly, South Africa is, probably has one of the most financialized economies globally as a proportion of GDP. Um, financial services are a huge among them. Pretty much everything we do in South Africa um, is driven significantly by what happened to the capital markets, etc. So when we speak of fees must, fees must fall, you can't not have a discussion or a bring into the room either this, um, issues around the capital markets or people who can speak to issues around the capital markets. Now, if we were having this discussion in London or Paris or New York, on that stage there would be someone who was or has detailed knowledge of the capital market, so that when we discuss issues to do with fees must fall or any other aspect of our lives, that that comes into the conversation. Because I, I think we can, and, and it's something I've noticed about South Africa, that we have these very cloistered conversations where we speak to ourselves quite a lot, but we don't speak across them with a huge spectrum of interests there are in South Africa and who impact the situations. So, so the issue of diversity, and, and I mean, one of the things that Mandela was quite um, good at, and, 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 and for some of us, it was a perplexing thing, was bringing people together of very different persuasions and views in order to address these, these very fundamental issues. And I wonder, Madam VC, if I could challenge you a little bit as, to, as we go forward with these conversations, if we can increase the spectrum of, of, of participants. Because I, I don't think with the best will in the world if we can properly address some of these issues if we don't bring the right people to the table. If we don't allow our, especially our young people who are driving an amazing fallist movement to be informed by some of these harsh realities which ultimately will drive these decisions that we, that, that we have to make and we, and we need to make. I just want to make a, a, final, um, a final comment. You know, um, advocate, you made. <laughs> You made a very important point about the way in which we project our, our own notions of Mandela um, in, 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 in the discourses about Mandela. Because, you know, one of the things <laughs> I've noticed about South Africa, you know, I have a unique, I think, position in South Africa. I'm a little, I'm a little bit of a coconut. So when I, when I speak to various people, you know, if I'm sitting in Parkhurst and having a, a conversation, and then I get the sort of the Parkhurst housewife view of Mandela, okay? And then I, and then I go to, 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 to Busy Corner in Tembisa, and I get the kind of the BE guy who's just made, had a, got a tender, and he has a particular view of Mandela. And these are almost entirely, entirely unconnected and contradictory. And I think part of the challenge we have in South Africa is that we've allowed them, these notions of Mandela to develop in isolation to each other. 
and, and we're not speaking to each other. And I'm sorry, but I don't know how we can make progress unless we start to align these notions. Because these are very powerful notions. And, I, and, and, and societies develop when, we, when there is a convergence of views on the important things. And I, sometimes I wonder if we're having that in South Africa. We, we seem to love diversity. We like, we, we celebrate diversity without really recognizing that in the end, we have to make decisions and we have to come to common and shared views. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. Ikama, Zukis, Notosa, MA, sociology, Rooms of Pet. Comrades, mine, man, is, is, is very short. On the log. Uh, on the question of uh, Mandela must fall, né? as a being, as an individual, not really, uh, but rather the liberal connotations attached to Mandela, uh, it is them that must fall. You know, because it believe, has been sweetened, a sweetener. You know, he's been reduced to uh, peace and tolerance. Uh, and it is because of us, Tina, as black scholars, you know, we subscribe to that. Uh, particularly even on the question of Ubuntu, because Ubuntu, when uh, people look at Mandela, they um, identify him as a person of Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu in itself has been reduced to peace and tolerance. They say you are because of me. That is not really the essence of Ubuntu. You know, and here in Atisilapa, uh, we're just merely, uh, how can I say this? As o o Nelson Maltenato puts it, we are just uh, translators of black uh, issues. Uh, because Mede uh, Mamawetu, uh, it is wrong even for us to have uh, this conversation here in this room. Pedro, the institution in itself is in Tatars. Uh, students are revolting. Uh, students are burning tires. I've been receiving calls myself to go there and support, you know, and uh, I will go and support Nam, Madam Vice Chancellor. You know, because we are just merely, merely translators of black issues. You know, uh, even at this level, you know, at master's level, we can't just write, you know, uh, about social ills. Because there's an ethics committee that will deal with your people. You know, we, we can't fully even express ourselves and write on the social issues. Because we'll be here we understand that uh, it takes a society to raise a child and that uh, institutions of high learning are the microcosm of the society and that in students in institutions of high learning ought to go back and plow back to the society. But when we are here in this gathering, we can't uh, 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 really, really grapple with societal issues. Itiba Elise has been sweetened uh, He's been identified as an individual of peace and tolerance, you know, and not to subscribe onto that. Because uh, it's a contradiction that we're having this conversation on Mandela must fall in an institution uh, that is named after, after him, Nelson Mandela University. We're having this particular conversation in this particular time where students on campus are revolting, you know, on issues of being, because Madam Vice Chancellor. And that was just my submission when I, uh, Pedro Mzili. I think the submission is open for discussion to anyone on the panel who wants to say anything. So maybe to end off. <laughs> more, of a, more of a comment than anything. Uh, Pedro. So... I'm, I'm probably just going to ask the, the conversation starters and our panelists to give just final comments then as well. You can incorporate what has come from the questions as well, but just to wrap up the discussion for us as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
There's just two points. I mean, one is just a follow-up um, a thought. You know, the problem with question and answers is that you obviously think progressively, like you have a thought, and so I want to just come back to a thought that, um, from following a question that you, you raised. And I, um, I mean, obviously, you know, the transformation agenda is important in terms of um, the racial makeup of university spaces. But I think it's really important that um, right now with white, uh, white academic staff, that they start, you know, as young people would say, start building their receipts, um, especially when it comes to how are they playing a role in contributing to the decolonization project and helping students um, in this, their personal self-actualization project. Um, and so I think that for me is very important. And the one point, I mean, we didn't talk about it on the panel, but, you know, so Madiba, you know, comes out of prison and um, becomes president. And, you know, also there's this um, tug of war with capital almost, right? So, you know, one day he's with, you know, the richest person in South Africa or, you know, um, rich cabals in a sense. And then the next day or that same day, then he's also with, you know, working class people and with communities. And so he's always had to, you know, navigate these different worlds. And to some extent, that's something that we all have to, to battle with, you know. So we have families that, so I have family, you know, living in you know, Hanover Park, Mitchell's Plain. But then I also traverse these very, like, rich spaces, not to the same extent that Madiba has had to navigate. And so we also have to think about, and, and, and right now we find ourselves in a country where we have a billionaire president in a, in a, in a society that's so unequal. So we have to think about, you know, what kind of contradictions are inevitable in a leader in, in a society that's really filled with contradictions? Uh, and maybe just be a bit more kinder um, about the, those realities. Um, so that, that's just my concluding thoughts. Um, my... Okay, my, my closing remarks, um, I, 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 I can't conclude without going through uh, the comrade sitting next to my vice chancellor. Uh, I didn't get your name, my leader. Sorry. Kojo Paris. Kojo Paris. All right. Um, Kojo Paris, you, you are saying that According to you, not everyone is in the room, and uh, we must call these people we are talking about. Um, <laughs> the point I want to make, my leader, ne, is that one, um, everyone is in the room, and if you, and, and, and if you, claim that you've been in South Africa then, I don't know which South Africa you've been, you've been seated on, right? Because we've had discussions with the people that you're talking about, right? That is why there's something called the HEHA Commission report that was tabled by uh, the, 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 the Commission of Inquiry that looked at the feasibility of free higher education, right? We've been to those stops, we've interacted with those racists, and their, and their view is still the same as far as the economy is concerned, which is the exploitation of our people for profit ends. And they have no social responsibility whatsoever towards the social good of this country. So what I want to say is that, um, the, 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 in fact, even the end of the discussion today is, isn't about that, all right? Um, at, at the center of the discussion today is with Madiba, uh, being uh, qualified as the name of the university, right? Looking at the contextual questions that came from the FISMAS for protests and how we move ahead as an as a, as a, as a institution, how then do we imagine these progressive possibilities that we're looking for uh, from our critical scholarship that we're going to do as a university? How do we quantify that, 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 that particular question? So that, the one that you're coming with was answered, my leader, Sikoti Legoyu. And uh, the third point I want to make is that um, at, the, at the center of the debate at the moment as well is this unresolved question of the cultural justice that I'm talking about coming from the must fall movements, right? Because at the center of the architecture of these institutions is how they socialize the type of graduate that comes out of them, like I said. And even the practices 
of its middle management, right? Because you're going to have the program carried out in your lower uh, workers and the students, and also the top management might agree with you, but the bulk of your middle management, how do you have a middle management that just has a, a attitude towards progressive outcomes that the entire institution wants to carry out, right? How do you make that section of the university not become a stumbling block towards the, the, the possibilities that we can achieve as a university that we, 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 we seek to do? How, how, how can you have different HODs? I don't know how to ask this question about the, the, that section of you, your, the labor force in the university that is a blockage towards what we what we seek to achieve uh, as a university. Because the liberal statements that you are speaking about, right, the cosmetic changes, right, if you trace their reproduction at the moment is at that level of, 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 of the university. Of course, it does not mean at the top and the bottom you can't have um, right-wing um, habits from, from, from that section. So you, you even hear the lack of commitment and agency towards dismantling the status quo, even in the usage of language, right? We were fighting for equality and equity. Um, all these words, man, of liberalism that have nothing that has to do whatsoever with shifting the, the balance of forces towards the, 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 the alternative. So the last point to conclude from my side is that um, the student movement must continue with a decolonial rhythm. There must be a strong a commitment towards scholarship. Uh, nobody must carry any program that is immune from critique. Uh, that should be our commitment. And the recording of archives and the capturing of, 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 of Mandela and what the figure entails when it is attached to a university. It's a project that is at its early stages that will continue to have critical studies for many decades to come. So we must not give up uh, on, on, on that project. It must all be committed towards uh, that project. Otherwise, uh, the, the protest is continuing as we speak. We don't want to destroy our university. We just want things to be done properly for the black child. Uh, so, so long as there are still commodification issues about students accessing the system, unfortunately, that revolt will have to continue until it is addressed uh, by these managers who are not supposed to be playing, to be playing games. They must stand up and address uh, the issues of the students because they know what they must do for the university to go back to normal and have a, a progressive project uh, for the black child. Thanks. So in the interest of time, my concluding remarks are going to be very short. But based on the conversation that we had here today, which I think was, was quite interesting and had me reflecting on a lot, I think in short we need to be realistic around what it is that we are dealing with and the pers persuasiveness, yes, that's the word, of of power and how power functions, how it reproduces itself, how it maintains itself, and you know, um, and what it is that it requires of us in this moment. I say that because I understand that there's an urgency in the moment to change things, but I also think in our urgency we we tend to not do the work that it's needed. We tend to not want to deal with the muddy waters. We tend to not want to actually build, but I don't mean build out of urgency, but build things that will last, so that we're not constantly going back and forth, not constantly having to reinvent, being pretty much being distracted in most cases from, from, from f experimenting forward or falling forward. And I, I do think that um, we need to reach a place where we are able to stretch across and be comfortable with being uncomfortable, but in an uncomfortability, having an end goal of building a future that we can all understand that um, 
that building a future that will be inclusive, but, and, but also understand that at its core, it has to preserve the dignity and humanity that we all share. I, I think for me, that is one of the biggest lessons I'd had to deal with and take from Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Uh, also, just uh, to sum up uh, in probably three or four points, you know. I mean, so what we get from it is that, from at least the conversation, is that so Mandela is not one thing today. But Mandela has never been one thing in the past either. That is not a bad thing, right? It was the ANC that decided that Mandela will also be a canvas for many other things beyond this sort of, today we call it struggle icon. So it was his own party that decided that Mandela will also be a collective symbol of national resistance. But after that, the ANC decided that he will become a collective symbol of national identity. So he has never been one thing. And I think for our generation, we should probably give up on the project of assuming that we can ever develop a uniform theory of understanding Mandela. We should accept that his personality, his politics, and probably his intellectual contributions are incapable of reduction into one thing that we can all agree on. And that is probably the greatest legacy that Mandela should leave us with. It's the idea that he is irreducible to one thing. There are still, even now, as we grapple with many writings and understandings of Mandela, many aspects of his life at a basic narrative level that are still yet to be explored. What about, for instance, Mandela the husband, right? Mandela the father, right? I am grappling now with a, a complicated project which I thought would take me a couple of months, but it's looking like it will be a couple of years. Mandela the lawyer. So many aspects of Mandela's life still require exploration. But in discovering Mandela the lawyer, I also discover someone like Desiree Finger, the very first African woman to qualify as an attorney. She was articled to Nelson Mandela. But I also discovered Douglas Lukele, the very first attorney general um, uh, of Swaziland, also articled to Nelson Mandela. So the more we research Mandela, the more we are likely to discover the impact that he has had beyond South Africa and the impact that he has had outside of the political milieu. And so the complexities of this man require further and probably more in-depth research. But perhaps more than anything, it requires us to approach Mandela with the right level of delicacy and the right level of compassion. I claimed earlier that I think he is probably the greatest revolutionary of the 20th century. I might revise that statement to say he is probably one of the great revolutionaries of the 20th century. He is probably comparable to Lenin, probably comparable to Mao, but he certainly falls within that category of the great revolutionaries of the 20th century. So, yes, we should obviously be critical of Mandela, but we must always understand when, what we mean by that. I think most of the time, we are talking about Mandela, the idea, in other words, Mandela, that part, the blank canvas. But that is a good thing. Many of us are unable to constitute everything and nothing at the same time. I'll then just take the opportunity to thank you again for sharing with us your insights and your inputs. I think everyone enjoyed the discussion as long as it was. Um, thank you so much to the audience as well for, you know, just staying involved and engaged and participating as well. I've just got three announcements. Um, lunch is going to be next door in the music building. So we go down the stairs, we go out, and then the building on our left will be where lunch is. And for obvious reasons, tonight's event will not be taking place on 2nd Avenue campus. It's going to be at the South End Museum. But we've reorganized then the shuttle schedule to then provide for 
to, to make sure that those arrangements um, can happen. And then the last announcement is that a gray VW Polo um, has left their window open. So if you could attend to that. Okay, so if everyone could uh, go to lunch, proceed, and then please can you return at half past one.